Hi, I'm Ann Mutchler, Executive Editor, EDA, at Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here in Santa Rosa, California at Keysight Headquarters with Steven Slater, Director of Product Management for EDA Products. We are going to discuss memory and high-speed digital design today. Steven, can you talk a bit about the technological disruptions we're seeing today with memory and high-speed digital? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to be talking about three things that we think you really ought to know about high-speed digital design for next-generation memory. We need to take a look at how memory has progressed over the years. So when we go back to DDR2 and DDR3, everything was very much about the load impedance, so the amount of capacitance that you saw on the receiver. And the transmission lines, which is what's connecting it, you have to be careful that we get these signals, the, the clock signal and the data signal, arriving right at the, the, the correct time so that we've got a maximum amount of margin. So the specs for DDR2, DDR3 were very much centered around these timing constraints. They call them like setup time and hold time. As they move forward into things like DDR4, then the specifications started to change a little bit because everything was going faster, the margins became smaller. They found the design started to become more limited by jitter. So they specified, okay, well, we have a certain amount of um, jitter, I can specify a mask, and as long as my signal stays outside of this mask, the quality of the signal should be, uh, should be good. So specifications here changed. That also then changed the way that you measured the signals too. And then as we move further forward into things like DDR5, this concept of having a mask margin has only just increased. And so now you, we run at such fast data rates, you know, 6 gigabits per second, 8 gigabits per second, that actually there's so much loss in the signal line, the eye decreases completely. So they went and introduced equalization. Can you talk more about that? Can you go into more depth on that? Yeah. Uh, so in this nice diagram, you can see that we've got um, the, the memory controller here. And traditionally, we would be measuring the device at where we can access it. And the place where you can access it is the, the, the package of the DRAM. You have a little interposer that it sits in, and then you can measure the signals that come off of it. And so this would be the, the measurement point, and we can define do we have good signal integrity going into the device. But now in things like DDR5, because they've added equalization, it means that the signal that we measure here actually is really distorted. Um, the eyes uh, disappeared completely. So with equalization, we can only really get a good measure of our final signal quality after the equalization's happened. You can see that's a big change because I can only physically measure here in simulation, I can see anywhere I want. So in simulation, I can, I can simulate uh, after the equalization. But in measurement, I can measure here, and then what they need to do is, in the test of measurement equipment, apply the equalization as a transfer function. So I can see what the signal is going to look like after the fact. So clearly, this is a pretty big change, disruption, in the way you simulate and the way you test. Can you go into more detail about how design tools are changing and adapting to address these challenges. So traditionally, memory and high-speed serial were two very different beasts. Memory on this side had a lot of interesting terms that cared more about, oh, well, what about the, the data cycle timing? They had this thing called data bus inversion. You know, alphabet soup of different things they did to reduce power, and to increase the amount of throughput and error correction and things like that. But over on this side, in high-speed serial, is very much more about getting the very fastest throughput. So you had these things like clock and data recovery, you had decision feedback equalization, and in this space, IBIS AMI was the modeling type that you would use in the simulation to capture all of the behavior of the transmitter. So as memory's changing now and now has equalization, the picture starts to look more like this. We keep all of these things, but then it starts to encroach and take over more of these things we traditionally saw in high-speed serial. So 
The prior simulation technologies used to just be based as SPICE, transient simulators. I may simulate for just 100 bits and look at the eye diagram. Now we're moving into the space where I care about the bit error rate. I care about how closed is the eye going to be after 10 uh, e to the 16 bits. That's a ridiculous number of bits to simulate. You're not going to be able to do it with transient simulation. This is a problem that has already been solved for high-speed serial. And so, this is a standard channel simulation flow for high-speed serial. The way you look at it is you've got your channel in the middle. You've got a model for the transmitter. It's typically called an IBIS model. It's a completely analog representation. You've got the uh, analog model of the receiver. This part here can be characterized as a linear time invariant system. So it gets characterized as an impulse response. And then we feed, you know, with this impulse response, we can look at what happens if we put a single bit through, see what happens to the single bit, and then I can superimpose those bits on top of each other. So basically I can generate millions and millions of bits in a reasonable amount of time way, way faster than if you had to try to do this with just a transient simulator alone. And then the uh, equalization part on the TX side and the RX side, this is kind of like digital signal processing, but that's all completely handled inside of these AMI models. So that's the traditional way of doing things for high-speed serial, but memory is slightly different. It's got its own challenges. So Stephen, what is it about memory that makes it different than high-speed serial? One of the most important things is that many of the signals in DDR are actually single-ended, whereas in high-speed serial, it's been a differential for quite a long time. Differential meaning that my signal, I'm actually transmitting on two, two wires, two uh, transmission lines, and so therefore I've got a plus signal here and a minus signal there. So the way that channel simulation would work to kind of characterize this part of it is what we do is we actually just say oh, I can characterize this with a rising step edge response. So I just kind of like stimulate it with a rising step edge response. What I actually get is something that maybe looks like this. From this step edge you can calculate the impulse response of that system and that is what we use as this whole center section here. Okay. What's different is that when you come to single-ended, unfortunately, these guys have a different response, whether you're going from a zero to a one, or if you're going from uh, the opposite way, from a one to a zero. So, you know, if it's, a, if it's a rising signal, it's got a different shape. If it's a falling signal, it's got a different shape. And that has to do with the way the transistors are set up in the transmitter and in the receiver. So, what we need to do, how the simulators needed to evolve, is first we needed to characterize this with a rising step edge, and then you get your, the actual step response of the system. And then we had to go and do the same thing and characterize it a second time with a falling step edge and get uh, something that was a little different. Putting these together, what you see is this is the type of effects that need to be captured in a simulation. So a different rate of rise time, a different rate of fall time. In high-speed serial, this eye is perfectly symmetrical. You can see this is clearly not very symmetrical. The next thing is because it's not symmetrical, the central crossing point is not perfectly halfway between the, the eye. In high-speed serial, it should be. But here, you've got this uh, DC offset. Okay, so the eye, the widest part of the eye is higher. The last piece that's you know, different in memory to high-speed serial is that over here, the data bits that come out of this side, it has circuitry inside the receiver to try and pull out the clock timings, the perfect clock timings for each of, uh, for, for this you know, bit train. That's not what happens in memory. In memory, you have an explicit clock which is running. And so I'll have, um, I'll have many of these transmitters, many of these receivers, and then I'll have one clock that's you know, making the same 
path, same journey from the, the memory controller to the DRAM. And then it comes in and clocks this signal. Here's the challenge. What happens if this signal has jitter on it? Okay, so this clock is making a, changing the decision point and that's going to affect where we are sampling this signal. So the actual I that we need to construct needs to take into account the jitter of this signal. Not only that, this clock also has equalization applied to it. So I can't just take the individual clock, you know, I need to go through equalization and then use it internally to the receiver. The other cool thing is that, well, if these clocks, the, the clock here plus the transmitter, if uh, they all started on the same memory controller, there's a good chance that the uh, jitter might be correlated. And if they're correlated, the data's moving forward at the same time as the clock moves forward and kind of by the same amount. So actually, some of the jitter gets cancelled out. So it's starting to get really complex, but the key thing is the modeling technology can handle it. Okay, the modeling technology has adapted. It's adapted so that this receiver takes a waveform in and the receiver also takes in the clock waveform which can be processed and added in and used to time the signal perfectly. So Stephen, how does this all look going forward? The outcome of the simulations that we really want is something that would look like this where even if we have jitter on the, the input to the model the model behaves correctly and is able to characterize or cut out the jitter. And then as you start to think about those, you know, next gen, what is next gen? There's companies working on pre-standard, you know, DDR6 or taking a look at GDDR7 and where we go from there. Many of those investigations or pathfinding, as they call it, have a look at different modulation schemes and uh, so things like, you know, PAM3, which is Pulsed Amplitude Modulation, three level, are things that you need your simulator to be able to handle in order to be ready for those next uh, generation techniques. And maybe I think the last thing, you know, to consider is that this is ultimately getting more and more complex. And so uh, product time scales are not getting any shorter. So how do we reduce risk? How do we make sure that we're not going to get caught out and up uh, when we come, silicon comes back or the, the PCB comes back and I populate it and I have problems on the bench and I need to troubleshoot. How do I avoid that? And I think one way that we can get there is through design closure with compliance tests. So Stephen, can you talk through what a compliance workflow looks like and what does it mean? Yeah, sure. I, I think many of our viewers will be very familiar with compliance test for you know the actual system of the board that's being manufactured. Uh, but one of the things that's unique about Keysight is we have the EDA simulation tool flows and we also have the test and measurement science, the expertise in those digital standards. So something that we can do in this uh, simulation workflow is make sure that you use the same golden measurement system, the same software to check for sources of you know, compliance issues early on. So catch them in simulation, such that when you get further down and you get the prototype back and test, you should have much less chance of being caught out. Thank you so much, Stephen, for your time today. No, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.